are you? Did you miss this corner of my bedroom as much as I did? The change of scenery to my closet has been as pleasant as it's been necessary, but there's nothing quite like cramming yourself between your dresser and your bed and sitting on the floor and talking to yourself for half an hour. I'm betting there's like a good number of people who originally subscribed to my channel for like Asian American, Chinese language, language learning sort of content and are probably really confused by the onslaught of gratuitous K-pop cover videos that have dominated this channel as of late. And I'm also guessing there are probably folks who subscribe for the gratuitous K-pop cover content and are probably wondering why this person is now risking it all to make a video about perhaps one of the most contentious and controversial political situations on our planet today. So to both of those folks, welcome and thank you. And yes, this channel covers both of those things and more because I contain multitudes. Anyway, I'm gonna start this video off by forewarning you that even though the title suggests that by the end of this video, I'm gonna be able to tell you whether or not you should boycott Disney's new live action remake of the 1998 classic animated film Mulan, I am sadly not gonna be able to make that life decision for you today. The short answer as to why is because that decision really, really comes down to how you personally, based on your identity and your experiences and values, weigh one thorny social justice issue against another. And also because you probably shouldn't be asking people on the internet how to think. But if you're like me and you still want to consider the opinions of the internet people, or at least one internet person, keep watching. Talks of a live action film remake of Mulan were in the works at Disney as early as 2010, but it wasn't until 2016 that this became public knowledge when Disney announced that they would be looking for an actress to fill the lead title role of the film. They landed on an actress called Liu Yifei, who has been described by the movie's Wikipedia page as well as numerous media outlets as a Chinese American actress. Which is absolutely true, given the fact that she's a naturalized citizen who was born in China, which is the case for many, many Chinese Americans. Like my sister-in-law, who, by the way, has her own YouTube channel. What kind of bacon is it? <laughs> I told you it's center cut! What the heck is that? It's hilarious. Check it out over here. But typically when people think of Asian Americans and Asian American actors, they probably think of what we tend to call second generation Asian Americans. That is, people whose parents immigrated to the US, usually before they were born, and who have spent their entire lives growing up and living in the United States. That this is the dominant narrative for the Asian American experience is problematic in many ways. Again, there are so many Asian Americans who don't share that background and they are just as Asian American. But in the case of Liu Yifei, Pointing out this distinction is important, chiefly because most of Liu Yifei's career up until now was made in the Chinese entertainment world. She was actually an incredibly prolific actress prior to her landing her role in Mulan, and it's pretty safe to say that she's way more popular and well-known in China than she is in the US. So as a naturalized American citizen, Liu Yifei is still Chinese American in all senses of the word, but her career and her public recognition is largely based in and accountable to Chinese audiences. All of this is very important because it provides a very necessary background to the controversy surrounding the film. Okay, fast forward to summer 2019. If you were paying attention to the news coming out of Hong Kong then, you would have known about the massive protests that were happening in the streets for months during that time. The initial trigger for the protests is tied back to an extradition bill that is, to be honest, a little bit too detailed for us to go into depth in this video. But what's important to note is that these protests represented a much larger, thornier discussion regarding Hong Kong's relationship with China. If you're interested, go Wikipedia that. And all of that is a can of worms that has existed for literally over 100 years and has only been creaking more and more open in the past 23 years. But a big reason why the 2019 summer protests became such a huge flashpoint was because because of one thing, police brutality. Yeah. One thing that's important to note is that at the time, Hong Kong was still governed by the Hong Kong government, at least on paper. So the police coming in to regulate the protest weren't PRC cops in uniforms with the PRC flag, but local Hong Kong police. This, however, didn't change the fact that on numerous well-documented occasions, Hong Kong police were seen and recorded using excessive force on civilian protesters in ways that were unprecedented for the region. People lost eyes because of rubber bullets, pepper spray, and tear gas were used indiscriminately on protesters. Police hid their ID badge numbers and 
members of the press who were wearing legitimate press credentials were attacked. And yeah, I know those of us living in the United States who have become so desensitized to police violence think all of this to be not a big deal until someone like literally dies, which is like pretty crazy to think about. Either way, I don't need to show or describe further these instances of police brutality in graphic detail because there's no point in re-traumatizing people for shock value. These protests were happening all throughout June and July 2019 in a massive scale in Hong Kong, but surprisingly or unsurprisingly, depending on how you're looking at it, the PRC media landscape stayed almost silent on all these issues. Coverage of the Hong Kong protests in state media was minimal to none. And obviously, few to no Chinese public figures or celebrities active in China spoke up about the issue. And it's not to say that Chinese celebrities don't talk about politics ever, quite the opposite actually. Back in 2016, when China was in heated disputes with Vietnam and the Philippines over disputed territories in the South China Sea, there was a massive coordinated social media campaign all across Chinese microblogging platforms like Weibo, where almost every Chinese celebrity you could think of posted this image that illustrates China's claim to the territories and states, China, not one inch of territory can be lost. But despite the heated situation in Hong Kong, the issue stayed relatively quiet in China until August 14th, when this happened. <laughs> Full disclosure, that clip was pulled from a video posted by CCTV, which is part of China's state-run media. Basically, this video of a Chinese reporter being assaulted by Hong Kong protesters was the perfect catalyst for a public opinion on the Hong Kong protest to finally come to light in China, albeit in one singular, very specific form. Folks quoting on social media this one line that the journalist was filmed in saying in the video. I support the Hong Kong police, you can come beat me up now. I say a public opinion, singular, only because for those of us who are used to being in a US-centric context, whenever these sorts of videos pop up, it becomes a controversy. That is, different people have different opinions on what happened in the video, who was at fault, what the context was, whatever, which usually just devolves into screaming matches on Facebook my personal favorite. But there was no controversy here because the public opinion in China on this video was so unified that this guy basically turned into an overnight celebrity and national hero. I'm not exaggerating on that last bit. This guy's name was originally Fu Hao, but following the massive public support from him after this incident, he actually changed his name to Fu Guo Hao, which literally means national hero. And as was the case with the South China Sea issue, basically almost every Chinese celebrity you know put up a post on social media with that quote, I support the Hong Kong police, you can come beat me up now, including Liu Yifei. As news of this came out, Liu Yifei was regarded as a police sympathizer who condoned police brutality and violence, and calls to boycott the movie that she was recently announced to star in started to bubble up to the surface as well. Fast forward to today. It's 2020, and believe it or not, the world is in worse shape than it was just a year ago, when one of Asia's most promising democracies was fighting for survival, and celebrities were openly supporting police violence. A year later, that promising democracy has all but completely collapsed, and police brutality is just a thing that seems to happen every other Thursday. And amidst all of this, after months of delay, Disney finally releases the live-action film for Mulan, starring Liu Yifei as well as a cast of other Asian and Asian-American actors for online streaming with the Disney Plus subscription and an extra $30 fee. And here we are on YouTube together trying to decide whether you should spend $30 to support a movie that retells a beloved classic Chinese legend, not to mention a staple of the Asian American film canon, and stars an all Asian cast, many of whom wouldn't otherwise have had an opportunity to star in a major blockbuster film, and deserves the support of an Asian American community with the purchasing power to incentivize Hollywood to tell more Asian stories after this. Or, Perhaps you should keep the $30 and boycott the movie because you believe that police brutality must be condemned everywhere? Perhaps because you're convinced that Disney was only reluctant to say anything about Liu Yifei's pro-police stance because they were afraid of alienating and angering the Chinese market? Or perhaps because the irony of an actress telling the story of a woman protecting her country while simultaneously denigrating the rights of Hong Kongers to protect theirs holds some moral weight to you.
When doing research for the video, I stumbled across the Instagram account for Gold House, which describes itself as a media collective with a vested interest in, according to the website, I quote, elevating the Asian diaspora's authentic societal representation and economic success. They're the group responsible for the hashtag Gold Open campaigns for movies like Crazy Rich Asians and The Farewell, and unsurprisingly, they're also running the same hashtag Gold Open campaign for Mulan this time too. Gold House has posted prolifically about the Mulan movie all over the social media handles, and these posts also, unsurprisingly, have drawn some criticism by those voicing objection to Liu Yifei's involvement in the movie. As I was scrolling through the comments, I was surprised to see Bing Chen, who is one of the co-founders of Gold House, responding to some of these critical comments. Here are a few quotes. So, don't support Liu Yifei. Instead, support the massive cast and an entire community of people who are depending on this film's success for their own careers. It's tough because art, by definition, should rectify who we are, so it's difficult to dislocate the artist from the art. But the reality is, in this case, you have to. And you have to remember how many other artists' careers are at stake because you're trying to make a statement against one person who never said what you just claimed in the first place. In another response, he says this, You're definitely entitled to decide how you spend your money and time. Our approaches are just different. We're not ignoring the comment, but there is a way to hold something you hate and something you want to exist in the world at once. I've decided the latter is more important to me right now because it's too essential in this fight for sustainable representation that we've made too much progress with. I thought these were fair and thoughtful comments that showed Bing Chen's sincerity and what he believed in and what he was truly passionate about. And if you're someone who's boycotting the film and is also not super keen on how media representation has become like the singular personality trait for, for Asian activism, it's easy to write off supporters of this film as boba liberals who see the capitalistic glitz and glam of Hollywood um, and white media acceptance as the ultimate ends to ending anti-Asian racism while ignoring the gritty realities of systemic racial injustice, a system that, particularly when it comes to police brutality, often benefits upper middle class East Asian Americans as it harms and kills black people and brown people and often poor Asian people. But I appreciate his heart and his sincerity, and I don't think it's entirely fair to call the folks working to advance Asian media representation as apologists for police brutality just because they're choosing not to boycott this film. But at the same time, I feel there's one thing that's very telling about Bing Chen's comments and something that should give us pause, which is the bit about compromising on something you hate for something that you value more. In the end, it's a trade-off. Do you support a cause that's deeply personal and meaningful to you, that you've perhaps spent a good part of your life and career advocating for, and that finally feels like it's making progress now, all for a nebulous political cause of which you're unsure of the details, and more importantly, that you have no direct personal connection or investment in? I think for many second-generation Asian Americans whose most formative moments in their identity can be traced back to like one movie where they saw an Asian character that looked like them or one K-pop star they saw in concert, framing the dilemma in this way makes the decision easy. Even when the social narrative or peer pressure or Reddit says that one thing is clearly right and one thing is clearly wrong, many of us will still follow the things that tug our hearts along. Like the chance to watch a movie that changed your life as a child and carries so many memories come to life on the big screen. And the chance to share it with your non-Asian friends who might not otherwise have understood or seen that part of you, proving to them that that part of you matters to the greater cultural narrative or at least to Disney, and that it should matter to them too. I think the sentiment supporting this movie that's the most difficult to counter is the idea that this, this film, is way too important for too many people. As Bing Chen puts it, it's important to the people working on the film whose livelihoods depend on its success. It's important for Asian American filmmakers who are depending on this film to succeed so that Hollywood will be more willing to greenlight Asian films and Asian American work in the future. It's important to Asian Americans who are still grasping for opportunities to see ourselves validated in media. And it's important to young Asian creatives who need to know what's possible in order to give themselves permission to create. And look, I'm not someone without empathy for us Asian folks who just want to see more people who look like us represented on TV or on stage. I know what it means to see your own culture and identity validated by people and audiences who, on a normal day, wouldn't even give people like us a chance. I know what it feels like to have once been an Asian kid who held a love of singing in one hand and the sober knowledge that they'd never be given a proper stage to sing on in the other. And if that doesn't convince you, 
Look, no Asian person who spends this much time creating this many K-pop covers is gonna say with a straight face that they don't care about Asians in entertainment, okay? But like I said before, it's a trade-off. What you ultimately choose reflects what's closer to your heart. And if you've not thought about the situation in Hong Kong much up until now, it just doesn't make sense for you to boycott a, an entire landmark film just based on something that you feel significantly less attachment to. Like Bing Chen said at the end of one of his Instagram comments, Enjoy your September 4th, and good on you for sticking to your informed position. Though this was, of course, directed at someone who was planning on boycotting the film. It swings both ways, doesn't it? If one cause holds more personal weight to you, then that's how you'll decide how you spend your Friday evening. But here's where I would challenge us to take this one step further, because all of this rides on this presupposition that our level of concern for a cause is directly correlated to how personal and how close to home it is for us how much it affects us in particular. We first, as humans, our first priority is for advocating for causes that directly benefit us individually, for instance, a fair salary. But at the next level, we advocate for causes that affect people within our in-group, people like us. Asian Americans who are not actors or singers or Broadway dancers will advocate for John Cho or Eric Nam or Issa Briones because they are, put simply, an extension of us. If they succeed, we benefit directly from their success, and so it makes sense for us to support them. Perhaps even support them over a cause that doesn't originate from our in-group doesn't have something that would yield direct benefit to us. What I'm saying might come across as incredibly cynical because it basically just boils down to Asian Americans only caring about other Asian Americans and Asian American causes because those things directly impact and benefit us. Things like unlawful detention at the US southern border or mass incarceration or Islamophobia or yes, even police killings of unarmed black people are things that we sympathize with but aren't nearly as enthusiastic to throw down for because we don't feel as strong an emotional in-group bond to those people, those issues that don't look like us and don't seem to affect us as much. We have a harder time seeing their liberation just as worth fighting for because we can't see an immediate connection to how that directly benefits us. And you realize that so much of our activism, our empathy, and our commitment for social justice causes is so dependent on what we have to gain from it. What we fight for doesn't have as much to do with universal values concerning anti-police brutality, anti-state violence, anti-authoritarianism, and the sanctity of human life but rather the lives and livelihoods of people whose success directly benefits us. It's what drives us to look at the choices we have in supporting an Asian American film or supporting efforts to condemn police brutality, and we pick the former because police brutality feels too distant from our realities to consider giving up something that, in contrast, feels much more proximate and precious to us. And I wonder why that is. And I wonder what it'll take for us to start tipping the scale in favor of things that truly, as a matter of life or death, freedom or slavery, are way too important for too many people. Anyway, like I said at the beginning of the video, don't trust strangers of the internet to do your thinking for you. My commitment to not telling you whether or not you should boycott the film still stands. It is still your choice. And if anything, I would hope that my analysis of the situation would have made you realize exactly how much it is your choice, informed purely by what you hold most dear to you. And if that makes you reflect and think a little harder about your choices and values today, then I've done my job. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button for more content like this. I also have a podcast that will soon be starting its second season, which I am particularly excited about because this season, I'll be interviewing some of the most brilliant thinkers, innovators, and dreamers in the education space right now, all of whom I currently have the privilege of studying with this year. Too, too much. Anyway, you can catch up on the first season's episodes right now at badchineseteacher.com and you can also check out this video that I made earlier this year about PBS's documentary series on Asian American history. That's right over here. Lastly, if you're into silly K-pop covers, just click on my channel and you'll find a whole playlist of that over there. Alright, that's all for now. Enjoy your weekends and I'll see you next time.